Three young boys ding-dong ditched my house, so I chased them down and murdered them. I'm Anurag Chandra, and here's a tale from my life. In the cold night of January 2020, I was startled by my doorbell ringing. Glancing out the window, I spotted three youngsters racing toward their car. Fear for my family overtook me, and I jumped in my vehicle, accelerating to over 100 miles an hour to pursue them. I caught up and rammed into them as hard as possible, sending their car spiraling off the road into a tree. Seeing the heavy damage, I retreated home, my plan a success. However, the day took a grim turn when the police arrived at my doorstep. They informed me that all three boys had died, and I was charged with three counts of murder and three counts of attempted murder. I tried to explain that my actions were in self-defense and fueled by the fear I felt for my family not to mention the alcohol influencing my judgment. Despite my pleas, I was convicted and handed a life sentence without parole. Follow for more stories. St. Bernard sits at the top of the driveway. In December of 2019, the Tot family disappeared in thin air, and when police arrived at their house, they were utterly disturbed. Hi, my name is Ethan, and here's everything you need to know in under one minute. Walking into the home laid the confused father, Anthony Tot, who had apparently taken a whole bottle of Benadryl. Wrapped in the blankets by the bed lay the decayed bodies of his wife, their three children, and family dog. When he sobered up, his story changed multiple times, but the one that stuck was was that him and his family had tried to unalive themselves because of the upcoming apocalypse. Apparently, if they unalive themselves in the same room, they would stay in the afterlife together. He even claimed that all three of his children, who were aged 13, 11, and 4, claimed that they agreed to take their own lives. Thankfully, he was arrested and sentenced to life in prison without parole. So in the 1800s, a man took his wife and two kids down into, or to Arizona, down into a canyon. Now, his whole reason in doing this was he was a prospector for gold. He would go out there and he would search for gold. He was trying to get wealthy. Well, he goes out one evening and he doesn't come home ever. And his wife, not knowing how to hunt, loses her ability to feed her kids. Weeks go by and her kids are starving and they're crying all the time. And she finally snaps and goes crazy. And then she does something horrible. She takes her kids and she... And then she uses their blood to paint all the walls. She then wraps them in a sheet and takes them out to the river and tosses them in. Then she lays down next to the river and she dies herself. Now the legend goes that if you're ever in Slaughterhouse Canyon and you hear the wells and cries of a mother, don't go looking. Indefinitely, don't go near the water. This story will make you scared of the woods. A man and his dog were staying in a very isolated cabin in the back country of Oregon in early 2010. One day he saw footprints leading up to his cabin, but then they disappeared. He was confused because there were no other cabins nearby. That night he woke up to the sound of someone walking on his roof. Though he didn't want to, he headed to the balcony to take a look. Nothing was there, but then his dog saw something in the forest and started growling. That's when he saw it, a freakishly tall figure squatting on a branch only 20 feet away from him, just staring at him. As he was backing up, he tripped over the door jam, falling to the ground. He jumped up, grabbed his dog and locked the door, ran to a nearby closet and locked himself in. For hours he listened as the creature knocked on the house as if asking nicely to just be let in. Follow because my next story is crazy. I bet you haven't heard of the darkest streaming service. I found this European streaming service called Viaplay that just became available in the US and it has some really dark true crime series. And one that I can't stop thinking about is the story of Natasha Kampusch. Natasha was just 10 years old and living in Vienna when she was kidnapped on her way to school. Her kidnapper was Wolfgang Preglopil and he took her to his home which was only 30 minutes away. He had built this tiny room in his basement under his garage and that's where he kept Natasha for the next eight and a half years. One of the saddest parts is that years into having kidnapped her, he would take Natasha out in public and she would make this same face that was in her missing poster so that people would recognize her. 
but no one ever did and no one reported him to the police. It actually wasn't until she was 18 and she was outside vacuuming his van one day where she was able to take off running. She stopped a few people on the street who wouldn't call the police for her, but she eventually made it to a neighbor's house who did. Now, she's telling her story in her own words on Viaplay's new show, Natasha Kampusch, A Lifetime in Prison. You can support Natasha by watching the show, and if you get Viaplay, make sure to check out some of their other series because they're really good. Imagine being locked up for 24 years by your own family, in darkness, hunger, and solitude. My name is Blanche Monnier, and this is the terrifying story of my life. Mysteriously disappearing at the age of 25, society forgot about me. But 24 years later, in a dark attic of our grand house in Poitiers, I was found, a living skeleton weighing 25 kilograms. The reason for my hell? A forbidden love with a poor lawyer. My mother, a powerful and respected woman, could not bear this romance. With the complicity of my brother, she drugged and locked me up. I was forgotten until an anonymous letter guided the police to my prison. When they opened that door, horror greeted them, me, chained, weakened, surrounded by filth and decay. After my release, I tried to rebuild myself, but the scars were too deep. I died in 1913, broken. My mother died shortly after her arrest, and my brother escaped justice. Who saved my soul by sending that letter? It remains one of the greatest mysteries of French history. My story is a chilling testament to the horrors that man can inflict. Follow Detective File for more stories. I'm going to give you three seconds to try to guess what's happening in this video. It's going to sound crazy, but people are saying that this light flickering is a desperate plea from a ghost. Let me explain. So this is the Halcyon House, and it's one of the most haunted houses in Washington, D.C. I talk about it in this week's episode, but this house used to be owned 120 years ago by a man named Albert. Albert went mad in the house and got into some really dark stuff. He thought if he ever stopped working on the house, he would die, so he hired a man to just continuously be working on the house. And he built whatever he could. He like doubled the size of the house. He built stairways that went nowhere. There was even a door on the top floor that just opened out into the air. Albert was this huge collector, so he would buy Greek statues and mummies and just live in the house amongst his collection. Eventually, Albert does die, and when he does, he has some really strange final requests. He wants to be buried on the property, he wants a wooden stake driven through his heart, and he wants a promise that electricity will never be installed. But none of his requests were ever fulfilled, and now people say that this light flickers because it's Albert trying to turn off the electricity. Check out this week's episode for more spooky stories. This photo is terrifying, but not for the reason you think. Sure, it does look like Abraham Lincoln is giving his wife a back massage from the afterlife, and that is spooky. But this woman here, Mary Todd Lincoln, was into some really witchy stuff and is the reason that the White House is haunted. Let me explain. And before we dive in, tonight's episode is all about hauntings of the White House, so you don't want to miss it. So when the Lincolns were in the White House, their youngest son, Willie, died of typhoid fever. He was only 11 when he died, and Mary, who was already suffering from mental health issues, was inconsolable when he died. And in her grief and desperation, she started holding Sam in the White House. At first they were harmless, she would just conjure the ghost of Willie, whose ghost actually still haunts the White House today. But then they started getting out of control and Mary was calling all sorts of ghosts into the White House. Guests would hear stomping and swearing come from nowhere, one person said they even heard Andrew Jackson playing the violin once, and the White House stayed haunted after she stopped doing these seances. When William Howard Taft was president, his aides said that they were being tormented by a ghost they called The Thing. And one woman who thought she saw it actually said it looked like a young boy. So when you see this photo, it may look like a gag, but Mary was up to some really witchy stuff in the White House. Be sure to tune in tonight for more spooky stories and history. Out of the darkness, this guy appears and grabs her by the hair. He drags the woman off the porch. Her screams ring out as the struggle goes on. Then the guy delivers a grim warning. We looked out the side window over here and witnessed him stomping on her and um, pulling her by her hair. It was, it was awful. That chilling video was recorded by a doorbell camera at a home here in Arcadia, California, about 20 miles from Los Angeles. The owner sent the footage to cops. They searched the neighborhood and say they found a woman being held captive inside this home right around the corner. Police identified the man as Robert Mendez and say he is the victim's estranged boyfriend. He was charged with suspicion of attempted murder and kidnapping. He was beating on her. Uh, looks like uh, he would have been stomped on her, dragging her. She had suffered multiple injuries, uh, enough to uh, require hospital attention. According to police, the woman...
The surveillance footage you're witnessing here is the last few moments of Lily Sullivan's life. She recently turned 18 and was eager to experience everything adult life had to offer. On December 16, 2021, Lily was out with friends at the Paddles nightclub in Pembroke, Wales, when she met 31-year-old Lewis Haynes. The two hit it off immediately and hung out for most of the night, dancing, laughing, and flirting. At around 2 a.m. that morning, Lily and Lewis left the club together in search of a bit of privacy before her mom was due to pick her up at 3 a.m. They walked to a nearby alleyway, which was secluded and unlit, giving them the privacy they had wanted. At 2.45, Lily's mom arrived and called her to let her know that she was waiting at a nearby gas station. Lily assured her mom that she was on her way and that she would be there in a couple of minutes. However, as the minutes ticked by without Lily's arrival, her mom grew increasingly concerned. She tried calling Lily a total of 30 times, but all of her calls went unanswered. At 3.08 a.m., Lewis is seen running across the bridge of the Pembroke Mill Pond, and two minutes later he reaches the very same gas station where Lily's mom was anxiously awaiting her daughter's arrival. Her mom immediately notices Lewis, sensing something peculiar about his behavior. He shakes his head a few times and even holds his head in his hands, exhibiting signs of unease. At one point, he turns back and makes direct eye contact with her before continuing onward and disappearing into the nearby woods. Unbeknownst to Lily's mom, the man she had just made eye contact with was the very same man who had murdered her daughter a couple of minutes earlier. This is the heartbreaking case of Lily Sullivan. Please get out of my apartment right now. Get out. Get out. Hello? Please come in.
Japanese teenager was brutally tortured and gang raped for 44 days before her body was dumped in a drum of wet concrete. On November 25th in 1988, 17-year-old Junko Furuta was biking home from a waitressing shift in Tokyo when 18-year-old Nobuharo Minato kicked her off her bike out of the blue and ran away. A 16-year-old named Hiroshi Miyano came to her aid and offered to walk her home. Little did she know this was a trap. Hiroshi ended up attacking Junko, raping her twice before calling that first guy, Minato, back. And then two other friends came who persuaded him to keep her in captivity. Here is when those 44 days of brutality would begin. And a trigger warning here, things are really about to get graphic. They held her in an empty house belonging to Nobuharu's parents. And there the boys would regularly gang rape her, torture her, and beat her. And not just the four of them, the teens invited other men back to the house with the express purpose of assaulting her. According to their own statements, they would force Junko to smoke and consume large amounts of alcohol. Then they would do things like douse her in lighter fluid and burn her, sodomize her, and starve her. She became so malnourished that she couldn't walk, and her burns and cuts were so infected that she became confined to the floor. Her poor little face was mangled to the point where you couldn't discern her features anymore. And while she was still alive, her body reportedly started to rot. On the 44th day, Hiroshi was in a foul mood because he lost a board game and he took it out on Junko. He doused her in lighter fluid and ignited it. And this is not the worst part. Over the next two hours, the boys excessively beat her. They made her drink her own urine. She was having convulsions. They repeatedly dropped an iron exercise ball on top of her until she succumbed to her injuries. They then wrapped Junko's mutilated body in blankets, shoved it in a travel bag, and then put that inside of a 55 gallon drum, which they then filled with concrete. They also threw in a videotape of the last episode of her favorite show because she said she had never gotten to watch it and they didn't want her to haunt them. The boys got caught and after a police interview, cops found Junko's body inside that drum and were able to identify her through her fingerprints. Hiroshi only got 20 years in jail, two of the others a minimum of five, and the last guy just eight years in juvie. If I could have chosen a different path now, I would have. What got Isabella Guzman into the state hospital? was not normal. She killed her mother, stabbed her 79 times. I'm not mentally ill anymore. I'm not a danger to myself or others. TikTok has a funny way of bringing up old relics from the past and turning them into memes, whether that be songs from the 2000s or the revival of Twilight. This is kind of what happened with the case of Isabella Guzman, an 18-year-old girl who was found guilty of murdering her mom all the way back in 2013. Videos of her during her trial started to get popular on TikTok when users would duet the videos and make fun of the way she acted during her trial, which was really weird. But behind these weird videos was a real-life murder that was so brutal, it kind of shocked me to see people actually making light of it on social media. Today, we're going to explore the case of Isabel Guzman and how her behavior made her TikTok famous years later. Isabella grew up in Aurora, Colorado and lived with her mom and stepdad. Her parents got divorced when she was a kid, but they were still civil after they separated, even buying a photography studio together when they did portraits. Yun Mi Hoi, Isabella's mother, would sometimes work 12 hours a day to make ends meet, and many people saw her as a really hard working lady. Despite this, Isabella was never grateful for anything her mom did or how hard she worked to support her. Those that knew the family knew Isabella was always kind of troubled and had a very mischievous side to her. She hated school and even though her grades weren't bad, they were nothing to write home about. She ended up dropping out when she turned 18 just a few weeks before her final exams. Her parents were disappointed to say the least when she did this, especially when she was so close to graduation. All those years of her suffering through school were literally wasted. 
Isabella's behavior only got worse when her mom remarried to a man called Ryan Hoy. Isabella resented her mom for replacing her dad, and her behavior towards her mom became so awful that she was sent to live with her dad, Robert Guzman. She ended up moving back in with her mom and Ryan, but they continued to have a bad relationship. In the weeks leading up to the murder, Isabella's disrespect towards her mom got really bad until one day, everything exploded. During a bad fight, Isabella yelled and spit in her mom's face. Ryan told police that his wife was terrified of Isabella after this fight, and matters were only made worse when the next day, Yun Mi showed him an email Isabella sent her during the night, which said, You will pay. With everything Isabella was doing and her escalating violence towards her mom, they made the decision to call the cops. The cops came to check on the family and spoke to both Isabella and her mom. They warned Isabella that now she was 18. Her mom and stepdad could legally kick her out of the house and make her homeless, which would be a good reason for her to fix her behavior. Isabella didn't have much to say to the cops, and after they left, she went up to her room and stayed there all night. You may be thinking that this girl sounds like a total nightmare to have in your house, and I agree. Living with Isabella and her behavior sounds exhausting, but according to Isabella, there was more to the story. Yun Mi and Ryan were both Jehovah's Witnesses, a branch of Christianity that's really strict and doesn't celebrate any holidays, including Christmas or birthdays. Isabella claims that she was abused by her parents when she was a kid, and this is why she was so disrespectful towards them. She also claims that the abuse got way worse after she decided she didn't want to be a Jehovah's Witness anymore when she was 14 years old. Even though Yun Mi and Ryan were definitely Jehovah's Witnesses, no one has been able to say whether or not they did abuse Isabella as a child. After police left, Yun Mi decided to go to work for the rest of the day and put some space between her and Isabella. Ryan stayed at home with his stepdaughter, who didn't come out of her room again until around 8.30 that evening. Yun Mi came home from work at 9.30 p.m. and told her husband she was going to take a shower. When she went upstairs, Ryan stayed in the living room watching TV and eating the McDonald's she brought home for him. Only a few minutes later, Ryan heard thumping and banging coming from the upstairs bathroom and Yun Mi calling out for him. When he went to investigate, he saw Isabella in the bathroom with her mom before she slammed the door in his face. Ryan tried as hard as he could to get into the bathroom, but Isabella locked the door. He knew straight away that his wife was in danger. He ran to get his cell phone and called the cops. When he went back upstairs, a pool of blood was leaking out from under the bathroom door. Yun Mi had stopped screaming and he heard her last words, Jehovah which is their name for God. What happened next sounds like something straight out of a horror movie. Isabella opened the bathroom door. She was holding a knife and covered in blood. She calmly walked past Ryan as if he wasn't even there and left the house. It was clear that Yun Mi was dead when Ryan got into the bathroom, but he still tried to perform CPR until the emergency services arrived. Yun Mi was pronounced dead at the scene, but she'd been stabbed a total of 79 times all over her face and neck. There was also a baseball bat in the bathroom, and it looked like Isabella had beaten her mom with it before or after she stabbed her. By the time the cops and paramedics arrived, Isabella was nowhere to be found, which worried everybody since she'd left the house with the knife she'd just used to murder her mom with. They tried to find her by tracking her cell phone, but this didn't work out since her phone was turned off. Luckily, Isabella was found in a parking garage the next day and arrested after someone saw her there and tipped them off. Isabella was charged with first-degree murder, and because she was 18, she was tried as an adult. This meant she could be given the death penalty. However, this is where things got even worse. Wilder. Isabella was found innocent. Well, okay, not totally innocent. During her trial, Isabella was assessed by a doctor who diagnosed her with schizophrenia, a mental illness that can cause people to hallucinate and have delusions. According to the doctor, Isabella didn't believe that it was her mom she was killing, that she was actually a woman called Cecilia, and she had to kill her to save the world. This evidence made it possible for Isabella to plead innocent by reason of insanity, which means she was so mentally unwell when she committed her crime that she didn't know right from wrong. The court accepted her plea, which almost never happens, and she was sent to a psychiatric hospital for proper treatment of her mental illness. Now we need to talk about what happened that turned this eight-year-old case into a viral trend on TikTok. Do you guys remember that song Sweet But Psycho by Ava Max? When that song came out in 2018, it got popular really quickly. Not only was it a super catchy song, but it had lyrics that were, let's say, a little controversial. Ava Max was actually called out on the song for glamorizing mental illness 
this by saying that it's okay to be psycho as long as you're sweet. Well, some users on TikTok took the meaning behind the song and started applying it to Isabella. During her trial, Isabella behaved pretty strangely, which makes sense now that we know she was living with untreated schizophrenia. A lot of the time, she would stare straight at the cameras in the courtroom and make faces where it almost looked like she was having fun at her own trial. People started taking clips of her making faces and gestures and put sweet but psycho over the top of it. This really divided TikTok. Some people saw it as harmless and they could totally appreciate Isabella's appearance and at the same time condemn her actions. But a lot more people really didn't like this trend since it seemed like people were trying to overlook what Isabella did just because she's pretty. Not only that, but making fun of her behavior when she was mentally ill added to the stigma around mental illness. A lot of people were called out, especially on Twitter, for making these videos and eventually the trend died down again. To be honest, I'm glad this trend didn't last long and looking at the videos some people made, it was really gross. It's not okay to excuse someone's actions just because they're good looking or charming. On the flip side, it's also really insensitive to make fun of someone in a mental health crisis. We need to discourage making content like this when it does so much harm to people who are mentally ill. Since she was sent to a psychiatric hospital, not much has been heard from Isabella. That was until November 2020. Isabella did an interview for the first time since she was sentenced and said she feels ready to rejoin society. She claims that she is no longer mentally ill after years of treatment and medication. When asked about the day she took her mom's life, Isabella said, that wasn't me. And now that she feels mentally stable, she is no longer a danger to herself or others. That isn't the only reason Isabella wants to leave the hospital. In 2015, it was reported that she was assaulted three times by a hospital employee and is now trying to have him arrested and held accountable for abusing her. Right now, there hasn't been an update on whether or not the employee is being prosecuted, and there is no update on whether Isabella will be released anytime soon. This case is definitely a heavy one, guys. But I definitely think it's important to talk about these things, especially when social media is involved. Did you guys ever see any of the TikTok videos about Isabella? What did you think when you saw them? I can't wait to read your thoughts and discussions down in the comments below. Thank Never cross the most haunted bridge in Alabama. Welcome to Hell's Gate Bridge in Oxford, Alabama. Legend has it that in the 1950s, a young couple's car plunged into the water below. And if you stop on the bridge and turn off your lights, one of them will sit in your seat and leave a wet spot. And then if you look over your shoulder at the road behind you, it resembles the fiery gates of hell. Though blocked off now, the bridge's legend lives on and some of the locals swear by their ghostly encounters. Is it true or a mere imagination? And would you dare to find out? Hell's Gate Bridge awaits. What the fuck? Is this thing on? Diary of a Wimpy Kid actor Ryan Grantham pleaded guilty to second-degree murder in March, and more disturbing details about this case were just released. If you don't know who Ryan Grantham is, he's known for his roles in Liz, Becoming Redwood, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, and most recently he was in the show Riverdale. On March 31st, 2020, the 24-year-old fatally shot his mother in the back of the head as she played piano. Apparently, Ryan recorded himself beforehand rehearsing the murder, literally acting it out. Hours later, he recorded his mother's body and confessed, and this is now being used in court. The next day, Ryan packed his car with several guns, ammo, 12 Molotov cocktails, camping gear, and a map. That map was supposed to lead him to Canada's Prime Minister, whom he planned on killing as well. The trip would have taken 50 hours, but at some point, Ryan turned around, and then planned to target his college university or somewhere else like that. Fortunately, Ryan turned himself in to Vancouver police before he could hurt anyone else. Reports stated that in the months leading up to this, he was experiencing the urge to commit violence to others and to himself. He had also stopped attending university and suffered intense clinical depression. It's believed that Ryan took his mother's life because he didn't want her to see him carry out the mass murder plans. The Crown is asking for at least 17 to 18 years before he'll be eligible for parole. And his sister told the court that he is a dangerous person and she fears him getting out of prison. 